It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Welcome to the teaching ministry of Life Changing Ministries International with Dr. E.K.D. Quick. With your Bible in hand and your heart open to learn, let's join the teaching. From the book of Revelation, we are continuing our series on the seven churches of Revelation found in chapters 2 and chapter 3 of the book of Revelation. And as we can see, if you have a red letter version Bible, these are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ speaking in each letter to the local pastor of that particular church. These were seven literal real churches that were found in Asia Minor, modern day Turkey. These were seven churches of the early church, per se. These were seven churches that had a different experience going on within them. These were also seven churches that typified every different church you can find today. These are also seven different churches that typify every different Christian you would find today. For example, there is the church of Ephesus, the backsliding church, or the backsliding Christian. There's the church of Smyrna. This is the poor and faithful church that suffers. And we have the poor and faithful Christian that suffers. There is also the church of Pergamos. This is the worldly church. Just like we have the worldly Christian. One foot in the church and one foot in the world. The Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. We also had the church of Thyatira. This is a church with too many works. Too many works that led to tolerance. Too many works that led to apostasy or that great falling away. Just like we have too many Christians that are too busy. That's leading to tolerance and a great falling away. Then we have the church of Sardis. This is the dead church, or what we would call the frozen chosen. There is also the dead Christian. Dead spiritually in the Lord has become cold and frozen. And we have the church of Philadelphia. This is the church with the open door. This is the church with lots of good works. This is the church that supports the gospel getting out missionary works. Just like we have the missionary Christian, the Christian that supports the furtherance of the gospel, whether it's going out in the mission fields, or whether it's just furthering Bibles in the native tongue of that indigenous country. This is the church of Philadelphia. And finally we have the church of Laodicea. This is a church that's lukewarm, indifferent, blasé, that's got comfortable. And we have Christians that have become blasé, lukewarm, and comfortable. This is also speaking to marriages that have become indifferent, blasé, comfortable. The honeymoon period may be over and you need a fresh anointing, a fresh honeymoon experience through God's love to your spouse. Now on today we're going to talk about this particular church, the church of Laodicea, found in Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22, taking these seven churches as we've learned scripture by scripture. The Bible states in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Verse 15, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Why? Verse 17, Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. 
I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. This is the church of Laodicea. This is the lukewarm church. This is the indifferent church. This is the church that's blasé. This is the church that's become lukewarm. Just as Christians today have become lukewarm. Neither hot nor cold. Indifferent, blasé, comfortable. Much like the church in America, the church has lost its zeal, it's lost its zest, its fervor. The gas in the gas tank has gone down. The honeymoon period is over, and the fervency of the love has dwindled away. This is the most dangerous position to be in. This is the worst of all the seven churches, and we're going to see why in a moment. Verse 14, unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. This is the messenger or the pastor, the leader of the church. As we've spoken before, this particular word angel is messenger, the human messenger, the local pastor over the church. Angels are not over churches. Local pastors are over local churches. The Laodicean church is spoken of in scripture before. In the book of Colossians chapter 2 verse 1 and the book of Colossians chapter 4 verses 12 through 17, there is a hint to the Colossian church that Paul had founded along its missionary journeys. Thirty-five years previous to this writing in the book of Revelation, you had the church of Laodicea that loved the Lord, that was on fire for the Lord, and thirty-five years later, almost a generation later, there is strong rebuke. Why? Because the love of the God has lost its priority, being comfortable and being blasé has settled in. All it takes is for one generation not to pass on the love of God, not to pass on the word of God, not to pass on the legacy of God, not to speak how good God has been, and then that gaining generation will not know who God is. And just like here, in the book of Revelation, there's a strong rebuke against the church of Laodicea, that after 35 years, they strayed away. The book of Joel in the Old Testament, chapter 1, gives a strong warning on how we should carry on the legacy of God to the next generation. It says here, Hear this, ye old men, and give ye all ye inhabitants of the land. Has this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. So we see here that the Bible gives us instruction, and in other places, to pass it on, to continue to tell the generation who God is, how good He's been, and the love of God. Back to verse 14, chapter 3, Revelation. These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. In all of these seven churches, we see how Jesus Christ identifies himself at the beginning of each letter. This gives each letter credence and power because it's not just a letter from the local pastor that's going to be read to the local church, but the author is the Lord Jesus Christ himself giving instruction and rebuke, condemnation and sometimes commendation to these local churches. Jesus Christ identifies himself As the Amen, this means true or truly, for he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father 
but by him. He is the faithful and true witness of God. When you see Jesus Christ, you've seen the Father. Philip said to Jesus Christ in the book of John chapter 14, Show us the Father, and it will suffice us. Well, Jesus Christ said, When you've seen me, you've seen the Father. When you've seen my love, you've seen the Father's love. When you've seen my healing, you've seen the Father's healing. When you've seen my deliverance and salvation, you've seen the Father's deliverance and salvation. For Jesus Christ is the faithful and true witness of God. He is God in the flesh. Emmanuel, God with us. It says here, the beginning of the creation of God. This speaks to him as being the creator, the creator of all things. Uh, the Bible says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. This is Jesus Christ, the creator of all things. Colossians chapter 1 speaks of his creative power. For by him were all things created, that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. This particular scripture in the book of Revelation is not speaking of him as being created, that's heresy, that's bad doctrine, that's false doctrine. This speaks of him as being creator, the beginning of all things. Verse number 15, I know thy works, and that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. This phrase, I know thy works, I know thy doings, is found throughout all the letters in these particular churches. This helps us to know that we should come to God in prayer, bow down on our knees and say, O oh God, search me, wash me, cleanse me, and have mercy upon me. Jesus Christ said, I will spew thee out of thy mouth. I would that thou wert cold nor hot. This is a dangerous position to be in. This is being lukewarm. This is being comfortable. This is being blasé. This is being indifferent. A dangerous position to be in because a person believes no change is needed. I'm fine the way I am. Leave me alone. I have no need to study my Bible. I have no need to assemble myself in church often. I have no need of change. I'm fine the way I am. This particular condition is dangerous because if a person is cold, they'll search for a place that's hot to get warm. They'll search for the heat to warm themselves up. If a person is hot, then they'll stay hot for the Lord. If they're not hot, if they're not cold, and they're lukewarm, they're comfortable. No change is needed. No growth is needed. No change is needed. I'm fine the way I am. What a dangerous position to be in. Verse 17. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increase with goods, and have need of nothing, including the Lord, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. This is a contrast. First of all, we may see our condition. Our condition saith, I'm increased with goods. My cupboard is full. My bank account has money in it. I have a 401k. I'm doing fine the way I am. I have need of nothing. And then God shows us the real condition. A condition that thou art wretched. This means despicable. The Bible says in the book of Jeremiah, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Yes, we are spiritual desperados in the Lord. If we begin to become lukewarm. If we become tolerant. If we become indifferent. Blase! Comfortable! If the fire has gone down and we think we're okay the way we are, we become spiritual desperados in the Lord, in our hearts. Miserable, the scriptures teach. There's a state of extreme unhappiness, in other words, that no matter what we fill the void with, drugs, alcohol, sexual behavior, pornography, partying, 
no matter what we feel the void in, we become still unhappy at the base and the core of our being. There's still something missing, and that is because our spirit is empty. Our spirit has been made in the image and likeness of God, and it will always cry out to be reunited with its Creator through the Lord Jesus Christ being born again. And it will be a, like a dog chasing his or her proverbial tail, trying to fill that void that can never be filled with anything of this world. It can only be filled with the love of God through Jesus Christ, being born again, being saved and washed and cleansed. And then the things of this world, whether it's a car or a home, family, good career, those external things then begin to allow us to receive and enjoy the blessings of God. We have to get our priorities straight, internal salvation and joy, and then external blessing. The Bible teaches, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things shall be added. This causes us to examine ourselves. Uh, we see the condition in verse 17 where we see our own condition, and then God shows us the true condition. David solved this problem in Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, when he said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me down the way everlasting. God is searching the very motive of our being that we may cry out to Him and be cleansed and washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Verse 18, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. This is Jesus Christ giving good counsel, a prescription. Gold tried in the fire speaks of true faith that is tested. First Peter chapter 1 verse 7, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than that of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, may be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. This is faith that money cannot buy. This is faith that though suffering may come, we still believe and hold fast to God. This is faith that no matter if our friends turn their back on us, we lose our job, our families, no matter what happens in our life, we still trust God. Job said, though he slay me, yea, will I trust in him. Job also said, when he had tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Then Jesus Christ said, White raiment that thou mayest be clothed. This is being clothed in the righteousness of Christ. The Bible says our own righteousness is as filthy rags. When we come to the cross, we exchange our sins and we receive His righteousness. Clothed in the righteousness of Christ. When Adam and Eve were in the garden... Their clothing was light of God. They were clothed in light. When they had sinned, that light went away. Fellowship was broken. And they saw that they were naked. This is what Jesus Christ is speaking of here. Clothed in righteousness. That God sees the righteousness of Christ. When we fall away, when we stray away in sin and fellowship is broken, we lose that light, that righteousness that we're clothed in, and our nakedness is exposed. We ought to be clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And then it says, Anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. This is being enlightened spiritually, and this is done through the Word of God. The Bible says in, the, in Psalm 19, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. For example, right here in the church of Laodicea, these individuals believed in the prosperity gospel. 
Yes, they thought that because they had money, they thought that because they were being blessed externally, that they were in good standing with God. However, God shows them their true condition on the inside. Jesus Christ said, You shall know them not by what car they drive, not by the size of their congregation, not by the size of their checkbook, but you shall know them by their fruit. Paul gives warning, being careful of the prosperity gospel. It says here in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 5, Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such, withdraw thyself. Yes, God wants us to be blessed. Yes, God wants us to have things. But God does not want things to have us. Yes, God wants us to have possessions, but God does not want possessions to possess us. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and then all these things shall be added on to you. Back to Revelation chapter 3, verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. It's a good thing to receive the chastisement of God. He loves us enough to correct us. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 12, My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as sons. God is chasing us to bring out the fruit in us, to correct us as we do our own children. We tell them the fire is hot, be careful. We tell them not to play in the streets when the cars are coming, to be careful. We tell them not to get into strange cars, to be careful of stranger danger, because we love them, and because we're trying to protect them from hurt, harm, and danger. It's the same as we with our relationship with God. He's correcting us by His Holy Spirit, tugging at our heart, pricking us and convicting us, where the Bible says, Wherefore, when the Holy Ghost speaketh, harden not your heart, as God is chastening us for His well pleasure, and to produce fruit that's pleasing in His sight. Back to Revelation, verse 20, chapter 3. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. This is an altar call by the Lord Jesus Christ. This is an invitation to discipleship, an invitation to fellowship. This is a choice that all of us have based on his invitation. Altar calls are given all through the Bible in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 30. Choose life that thou mayest live. Elijah had said, How long ye ought between two opinions? If God be God, follow him. Altar calls are given every day of our life, as we are given the gift of waking up each day. We are given a choice to serve God, or not to serve him. What a gracious, loving God we have, to give a daily altar call to serve him. Back to Revelation, chapter 3, verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and have sat down with my Father in his throne. There is a promise of overcoming in every letter. And to our local churches and to the local Christian, a promise that if you overcome, there is a heavenly promise, an inheritance waiting for you and I. For the Bible says in the book of 1 Corinthians, Know ye not that the saints shall judge the world. The Bible says, Know ye not that the saints shall judge angels. Jesus Christ said, Fear not, little flock. It's my Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Jesus Christ said, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in Jesus. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you so. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, 
I will come again and receive you unto myself, so that where I am, there ye may be also. What a promise in Scripture that God has an inheritance for you and I, not because we deserve it, but because God is gracious and merciful through the Lord Jesus Christ to allow us to live with Him forever because we love Him through Jesus Christ. What a gracious, loving God. Verse 22, chapter 3, last scripture. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Jesus Christ speaking to the pastors through the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit speaking to the pastor, and speaking to every individual, speaking the words of God, and allowing them to say, if you have an ear to hear, let him hear. God is speaking through the sermon. God is speaking through the track that's given out as a witness. God is speaking through the missionary on the missionary fields. God is speaking in every native tongue throughout the earth. God is speaking through the radio ministry, television ministry. God is speaking by the light of a husband to a wife. God is speaking by the light of a wife to a husband. God is speaking through the light of parents to the children. And through the light of children to their parents. What a mighty God we serve. God is speaking through creation. God is speaking through the spoken word. God is speaking through the Bible. God is speaking through the final authority of the Bible itself. God loves us so much. He is saying, He that has an ear to hear, let him hear. I know today, if you have strayed away from God's love and kindness, or if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I invite you to pray this prayer with me today. This prayer will change your life. Repeat after me. Oh God, I am a sinner. I have strayed away from your loving kindness. I believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins. I believe that God raised him from the dead. Come into my heart. Come into my life. Save me today. Forgive me, I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. And Amen. Thank you for listening to the teaching ministry of Life Changing Ministries International. LCMI is a Christian non-denominational teaching ministry based solely on the Holy Bible, dedicated to pleasing God, glorifying Jesus Christ, and ensuring that the Bible is the foundation in everything this ministry proclaims and endorses. For more information, log on to our website at lifechangingministries.com. Please join us again next time for more Bible teaching. And remember, we have the victory through Jesus Christ.